A century ago, the great polar explorers were pushing further and further towards the coldest places on Earth, the North and South Poles. The competition to reach these goals was matched by a less publicized but equally daunting scientific endeavor, the attempt to reach the coldest point in the universe, absolute zero. This mysterious barrier was a physical paradox as tantalizing as the speed limit of light, which can also never be exceeded. It was a frontier so enticing that rival physicists from all over Europe began a race towards this absolute limit of cold. This is a story of showmanship, setbacks, rivalry and despair. The stakes were high. For the winner, there was glory and the chance of a Nobel Prize. For the loser, the prospect of being a forgotten foot soldier of science. When explorers ventured into the Antarctic, they experienced some of the coldest temperatures on Earth, reaching down to minus 80 degrees centigrade. But this was nothing compared to the ultimate limit of temperature, absolute zero, at around minus 273 degrees. Only in a laboratory, by liquefying gases, could adventurers take the first steps towards this holy grail, a place utterly drained of all thermal energy. Among the front runners in the race towards absolute zero was James Dewar, a professor at the Royal Institution in London. It will be the greatest achievement of In 1891, he gave one of his celebrated Friday night public lectures on the wonders of the supercold to celebrate the centenary of his great predecessor, Michael Faraday. The descent to a temperature within five degrees of zero would open up new vistas of scientific inquiry, which would add immensely to our knowledge of the properties of matter. James Dewar is a canny um, and I think very ambitious, practically minded Scottish scientist. He could really show both his colleagues and the fee-paying audiences who came to his immensely successful, brilliantly engineered lectures um, some of the secrets of nature. Take this rubber ball. It bounces well, I think you'll agree. But let's see what happens after a few seconds immersion in liquid oxygen. Dewar invented the vacuum flask to carry out his research, and it is still called a Dewar to this day. Now, let's see what happens. This uh, phantasmagoric aspect of science always helped science to be accepted by the public. Uh, though it is a little mystifying, it did play a role of having society, having the public accept that these weird people in the laboratories are doing truly interesting, if not magical things. James Dewar's life was defined by the cold. As a boy, he used to skate on a frozen pond in Scotland. He claimed in later life that his most formative early experience resulted from an accident on the ice. After Dewar fell through the ice, he was rescued uh, 
But when he got home, he, they discovered that he had rheumatic fever, uh, which put him in bed for eight months. And uh, he was in danger of having his limbs atrophy with palsy. And so the village joiner set him tasked to develop uh, his limbs, especially his hand. And one of the tasks was to make a violin. And he developed a great deal of mechanical aptitude, which stood him in very good stead in later years when he had to create apparatus for his use. Dewar's dream was to take on the mantle of the Royal Institution's greatest scientist, Michael Faraday. Seventy years earlier, Faraday had done experiments showing that under pressure, gases like chlorine and ammonia liquefy. And as these liquids evaporate, their temperature drops dramatically. Faraday was curious to see if this method of pressurizing gases into liquids could be used for all gases. But some gases, what he called the permanent gases, would not liquefy, no matter how much pressure he applied, so he abandoned this line of research. Faraday's was a mind full of subtle powers, of divination into nature's secrets. And although Unable to liquefy the permanent gases, he expressed faith in the potentialities of experimental inquiry. The lowest point of temperature attained by Faraday was minus 130 degrees centigrade. For over 30 years, no one could reach a lower temperature than minus 130 degrees. Absolute zero remained an elusive and very distant goal. Now Michael Faraday in the uh, early to mid 19th century had left a kind of forlorn frontier for physicists and chemists. What he called the permanent gases, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, which no means whatsoever seemed to be able to liquefy. And this was a kind of no man's land which one could not cross. And that was a standing challenge for the scientists of the later 19th century. It must be possible to turn these gases into pure liquids. It was not until 1873 that a Dutch theoretical physicist, Van der Waals, finally explained why these gases were not liquefying. By estimating the size of molecules and the forces between them, he showed that to liquefy these gases using pressure, they each had to be cooled below a critical temperature. At last, he had shown the way to liquefy the so-called permanent gases. Oxygen was first, and then nitrogen reaching a new low temperature of almost minus 200 degrees centigrade. Only the last of the permanent gases remains to be liquefied. Hydrogen, in the vicinity of minus 250 degrees centigrade. It will be the greatest achievement of our age, a triumph of science. Dewar was determined to be the first to ascend what he called Mount Hydrogen. But he was not alone. The competitor Dewar feared most was a brilliant Dutchman, Heiter Kameling Onnes. Kameling Onnes was uh, younger than Dewar. Um, and to a certain extent looked up to the Scotsman as his senior. Um, Dewar didn't have the same, if you'll pardon the expression, warm feelings towards his rival in the race for cold. Dewar recognised that Kameling Onnes had a new radical approach to science and was planning an industrial scale lab. When Onnes took over the physics laboratory in Leiden, he was only 29 years old. And, well, he gave his inaugural address here in this lecture room, the big lecture room of the Academy Building of Leiden University, and it was all there. He was explaining what to do in the next years, and he was talking about uh, liquefying gases, making Dutch physics uh, famous abroad, and, well, it was amazing how 
far-sighted all those visions were. Kameling Onis's lab was more like a factory. He recruited instrument makers, glass blowers, and a cadre of young assistants who became known as Blue Boys because of their blue lab coats. Later, he set up a technical training school, which still exists to this day. Dewar and Onis could not have been more different. Dewar was very secretive about his work, hiding crucial bits of apparatus from public view before his lectures. Onis, on the other hand, openly shared his lab's steady progress in a monthly journal. Onis was the tortoise to Dewar's hair. In the case of Dewar, you had a brilliant experimenter, a person who could actually build the instruments himself, and a person who really believed in the brute force approach, and that is, have your instruments, set up your experiment, and try as hard as you can, and then you'll get the results you want to get. Uh, in the case of Camelichones, you have a totally different approach. He is the beginning of what later on was known as big science. Unlike Dewar, Ones thought detailed calculations based on theory were vital before embarking on experiments. He was a disciple and close friend of van der Waals, whose theory had helped solve the problem of liquefying permanent gases. Though their approaches were different, Kameling Ones and Dewar used a similar process in their attempts to liquefy hydrogen. Their idea was to go step by step down a cascade using a series of different gases that liquefy at lower and lower temperatures. By applying pressure on the first gas and releasing it into a cooling coil submerged in a coolant, it liquefies. When this liquefied gas enters the next vessel, it becomes the coolant for the second gas in the chain. When the next gas is pressurized and passes through the inner coil, it liquefies and is at an even lower temperature. The second liquid goes on to cool the next gas and so on. Step by step, the liquefied gases become colder and colder. Each one is used to lower the temperature of the next gas sufficiently for it to liquefy. In the final stage, where hydrogen gas is cooled, the idea was to put it under enormous pressure, 180 times atmospheric pressure, and then suddenly release it through a valve. This would trigger a massive drop in temperature, sufficient to turn hydrogen gas into liquid hydrogen at minus 252 degrees, just 21 degrees above absolute zero. Here was the risky bit, because his apparatus was um, going down in temperature, getting very, very cold, so very fragile, quite easy to fracture, while at the same time the pressures he was working at were very, very high, so the possibility of explosion. He took the most amazing risks, both with himself, he was a lion of a man in terms of courage, and with those around him. All the equipment he was working with could have crumbled or blown up, and more than occasionally, it did. Dewar had many explosions in his lab. Several times, assistants lost their eyes as shards of glass catapulted through the air. In the notebook, he actually writes, jots down many details of what happened in the apparatus, but not what happened to his assistants. So somehow you get the impression that apparatus is more important than the assistants.